I'll approach my presentation just to look at the strategic context in terms of the governance of the ocean and then the challenge with regards to um, governance uh, in the ocean itself and then the paradigm shift and I'll conclude. Um, back in 1600, Grotius said that the sea is one of those things that cannot become the private property of people. It cannot be the territory of any people whatsoever. And so the principle of freedom of the seas was born, this uh, institution, Mara Liberum. But by the 1900s, the sea had become, and the law of the sea, into a state of disorder, border, and chaos. And so uh, the principle of Mara Clausum was introduced. And it's these two principles that underpin governance of the ocean today. They underpin the relationship we have in this country with the sea, and they gift us one of the largest sea areas to land ratios in Europe, an area almost three times the size of Germany an area rich in biodiversity and in, rich in wealth, an area that extends 600 nautical miles or 1,200 kilometers into the ocean. And yet we only get 1.2% of our GDP from the maritime sector. And if you look at our neighbors, UK gets 5%, Belgium gets 8%, Denmark gets 11%, and Norway gets 20%. So here's an opportunity. An opportunity if the governance regime is correct. And the governance of the ocean is um, a triple helix. It is a relationship between government between society and between the market, married together by norms such as sustainability, such as precaution, and such as ecosystem approach, with good science and a, a, an integrated, I suppose, a regime for a compliance and regulation. And that's where we come in, the Navy. Our Navy has shaped over the last two decades, uh, first of all by reviews by Price Waterhouse in 1994, again in 1998, and more recently by the White Paper on Defence that has structured our policy in which we actually follow with our strategy. But one game changer happened in 2004 and it was the evolution of the National Maritime College of Ireland where we shifted from a closed innovation service looking inwardly from our innovation perspective to a more open innovation looking with other actors at sea. And this was a game changer which brought us into a whole new world of looking at the way we do our business. It also drove the way we actually approached our service delivery ethos. It made us look on the consumer of the service and not the Navy as a producer, not the Navy as a self-licking ice cream. We asked the question, what the government want and what the civil society want? And that's the way we shaped our organization. And this, I suppose, triple helix was created by Klautswitz back in the 1800s, and I'll come back to that. So, the challenge, why do we need to be exercised with regards to the governance of the oceans? We have the richest wave energy resource in the world. Statistically, the largest wave ever measured by scientific instrument was measured 500 nautical miles off the west coast of Mayo. It's also our battle space. I call it our Afghanistan, an area that can do this to that. That's not the way you actually carry containers on a ship. <laughs> it's also an area that actually sustains the global economy. 90% of world trade by value travels by sea. 97% by, by, by volume travels by sea. It's also an area where bad actors actually operate. And here we have some slides of some of the terrible things that have happened off our coast, the Eskand, the Ashumaritan, and the tragedy of Air India. Other actors such as cocaine and cannabis shipments from cocaine from South America, cannabis from North Africa, transit through our area. And well, as well, we have good actors like fishers. Ireland has one of the richest fisheries in Europe, and it's an area where there is huge opportunity in terms of rationalization into the future. Other areas in terms of the environment side is dealing with HABs, harmful algal blooms that can actually destroy agricultural industry along the west coast, and rich areas of biodiversity. P few people know that the ocean is the largest active carbon sink in the earth, and yet it is becoming more acidic. Areas like this, rich marine, vulnerable marine ecosystems are being destroyed because of the increase in acidity. And also, they're not just being destroyed by acid, they're also being destroyed by actors who are actually reckless in terms of the use of their trawl nets. It can take 8,000 years for a reef like that to form. It takes 30 seconds for it to be destroyed. We have huge resources in terms of hydrocarbons, in terms of mineral wealth, and I'm delighted to see the exploration progressing on the West Coast. And other actor actors work in our sea area. The connection in terms of high-speed fiber optic cables from the US to Europe, I suppose powering half the world's GDP. So the paradigm shift, you know, governing an area like that requires resources. Sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imaginary than real. And ocean governance requires resourcing. But how can you resource the governance of the ocean when you're dealing with an economy whereby the outgoings are less than the tax intake? And that's a challenge. 
So fortunately for us, our Minister for Defence has driven an innovation policy which has actually led to an enterprise dimension in terms of how we do our business. Our Chief of Staff has been driving a transformation agenda. And for us within the service, from bottom up, we've identified a new enemy. The enemy is the economic deficit. And every enemy, and recalling my friend Klautzwitz, has a centre of gravity. It's that point in which you focused all your energy with regards to defeating that enemy. So what's the enemy and where do you focus your energy? You attack unemployment. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we use to create them, Einstein said. So the Department of Defence and the Defence Forces will drive at the creation of a platform that will lead to the creation of jobs, and that's the space we're in today. So back to Klautzfitz and his trilogy, the relationship between the military and between government and the relationship between the military and civil society. And if we look at governance, it's the relationship between market and government and market and civil society. And my quadruple uh, helix is the relationship between civil society and the military, military and the government, and military and the market. And that gives us a new dimension in terms of how we can do our business. Shift our, shift our mindset from being seen as a consumer of resources to being a producer and enabler of resources and enabler of wealth. So we need to differentiate within the public sector and we need to differentiate in the Navy. We've created this platform which is bottom up. It's about trust, it's about reciprocity, it's about collaboration, it's about evidence-based and it's about communications. And I'll come back to it in a moment. We've also got the Defence Enterprise Committee, which is driving relationships with industry and academia. And more recently, we are about to publish our Green Paper in the Defence, which will have an innovation chapter in it. The government last year launched this Harnessing Our Ocean Wealth, which actually is a strategy for harnessing wealth for the state out of the, the maritime jurisdiction that has been gifted with. Harnessing wealth in a manner which is sustainable. So the focus of the Navy is towards the producer of resources and effects the codification of knowledge within the organization itself and within its people, and also the idea of institutionalizing wisdom, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But you also, to gain power, you have to actually seed power. You have to share power, and I'll come back to that. Because there are two cultural changes within the organization that I see. One is the issue of dealing with this mass of data, this mass of information, and the second is the whole issue of how to institutionalize innovation. If you think about the world today, there are about 3.8 zettabytes of data, million around as we sit in this room. Data that are giving us text messages, emails, data that are actually informing everything we do. In many ways, we're smothered by data. And yet by 2020, there will be 40 to 50 times this, uh, 40 to 50 zettabytes of data. And imagine how difficult it is today to handle data. Imagine the world in 2020. So the European Union has been driving this whole idea of a common information sharing environment and moving, in our case, in the case of the military, we have to move from this mindset of a need to know to a need to share. And this need to share will have you see data go to information, information to intelligence, intelligence to knowledge, and the application of that knowledge giving you wisdom. But the other side is innovation, and using innovation in the context of development of capability, capability that in the past we could not, explore, could not afford, but today we can. And also looking at capability development in the context of societal impact, not just looking at the Navy in the context of it being a self-licking ice cream. Innovation really drives and comes from what Darwin says, we, those who adapt survive, not the strongest and are the fittest. So I'm thankful to Intel for this slide, and I'm not too sure, I was trying to find the source of it, but that was the Navy back in the 80s. This was the Navy about 10 years ago in terms of moving into this space of open innovation, and this is the Navy today in terms of ecosystem-centric innovation. Moving from left to right, where we can add value to civil society, we can actually have impact in terms of our relevance, and we actually can contribute to job creation. But ecosystem-centric innovation doesn't happen easily. It's about dealing with the diversity. It's about the sailors mixing with the academics, mis mixing with the en enterprise, mixing with the intels and the EMCs. It's also about the diversity and the multidisciplinary side. At the core may well be engineering and that, but you also need your, your social scientists and your political scientists, and you also need to mix other practices within your workplace, looking at sharing areas such as your HR policy, your supply chain management, with enterprise, and saying, have we got the best mix here? but it's also about a hedge for complexity because we live in a world of complexity and we need to actually have greater resilience within our organizations to deal with this world of complexity. So the sailor is the key actor in this. Yes, we need warriors and we need to develop their skills in terms of making them good at their core function, but we also need entrepreneurs and diplomats. 
and I think it was interesting to listen over the last couple of days, is that mix in terms of the social function of individuals and how they can create networks. That's a social skill, and that's critical that's developed, and diplomats are very good at that, and that's what we try to do in the service. But we also need scholars. Education is the production line of intelligence, and intelligence is the bedrock for knowledge. And so therefore, we need these multifaceted individuals to deal with complexity. How do you do it? Well, you first of all sensitize mindsets. And secondly, you drive a culture that actually leads to innovation partnerships where you can sense and explore that fleeting objective that otherwise you wouldn't see on your own. And when you see it, and you do so with a partnership, you create a partnership because then you can seize and exploit it. Sensing, exploring, seizing and exploiting with regards to the creation of knowledge, the application of wisdom, and the application of your capability and leading to job creation. It happens, I think, in terms of relationships. So therefore, the clustering side is very important. The clustering side between enterprise, between end users like the Navy, and the clustering side between um, the research community. It happens at a local level in the first instance, but it can have a national impact. Indeed, it can have a regional impact, and it can have a transatlantic impact. The platform we created, bottom up, was the IMERC uh, institutional arrangement, a triple institutional arrangement between the Navy, University College Cork, and Cork Institute of Technology where we actually are driving, using knowledge to create power. It was launched by our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, in 2011, and it actually is all about maritime and energy, looking at four pillars, shipping and transport, looking at energy itself, looking at maritime security, and looking at recreation in the areas in which we're going to develop and create jobs. So far, we have about five uh, FDIs that have spun in, with a number of SMEs that have spun out. So far, we've created about 30 jobs this, in 2012 and about 25 focused for 2013. But we have very ambitious targets into the future. The Naval Service driving end-user-defined solutions to end-user-identified problems, working with the research community and working with the enterprise community. Our outputs are applied technology, greater knowledge, but also getting enhanced service provision and job creation. So back to this jurisdiction, a huge jurisdiction that needs resources to actually govern. And if we go to this actor, whoever he is, good or bad, and he's moving into our jurisdiction, technology can be very good. And it can actually bring the focus on terms of who he might be, where he might be, when he might be, and perhaps to what. But ultimately, it's back to the sailors in this platform, which is institutionalized by two things, the flag that it carries on the mast, and the fact that there are military sailors that turned this from being a piece of metal into a warship. They're the requirements of international law. And that's the ship that will tell you the who, the what, the how, and the why. So to conclude, I used to think in terms of the service that you had your core function in terms of delivery of defense, security, and government services, and you had a small bit of a supporting effort which was about innovation. I was wrong. It actually is all one effort. It's one effort leading to our strategic end state, which is to protect and enhance Ireland's interests at and from the sea. It's a change that creates a new dimension in performance. It's organized, systematic, and it's rational work. And it also is leading to enhanced service delivery, cost-effective and efficient fleet, relevance, and job creation. To conclude, the Navy does serve government and civil society. It protects and furthers our interests at and from the sea. Information sharing and complexity, the complexity re reality require that we have networks, and we also have a unity of effort. Innovation is helping the Navy shift from being a consumer to a producer of resources. It is facilitating the creation of capability. It is leading to enhanced service delivery. It is re reinforcing our relevance with civil society. But most of all, it's leading to job creation, so therefore it's defeating that economic enemy. Finally, back to the ship, this piece of metal. It's not a ship that makes a ship's company. It's a ship's company that makes a ship. So that's really why we have focused on who makes the ship's company. It's the people, it's the individuals, and that's the reason our individuals are actually been driven forward to develop them as warriors, to develop them as scholars, but also to develop them as entrepreneurs and actually diplomats. And that's where our vision is, to be the smartest, most innovative, and responsive naval service provider in the world by 2016. Thank you.